when the Buddha talks about the five clinging aggregates, it's always in the context of the Four Noble Truths. In fact, it's his definition of the first noble truth, the truth of suffering or stress. Clinging to the five aggregates is stress. It's important to keep that context in mind, because sometimes you hear the five clinging aggregates defined as the Buddha's answer to the question is, what are we? As beings, we're nothing but clusters of aggregates. But the kind of question that would ask, what are we, is specifically the kind of question the Buddha would not answer. He wasn't concerned with defining us, what we are. He was more concerned with how we define ourselves, and the fact that the way we define ourselves is suffering. We cling to the aggregate of form, which is the body, the aggregate of feeling, which are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. We cling to perceptions, our images labels we put on things. We cling to fabrications, the way the mind puts thoughts together intentionally. We cling to consciousness. And in clinging to these things, we make ourselves into a being. Now why do we do that? Well, because of craving. That's the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. We crave sensuality. We fantasize about pleasures that we'd like to get. And then to get those pleasures, we need to take on an identity. This is why the Buddha talks about this kind of craving as craving that leads to becoming. Because once there's something you want, that thing exists in a world. And to get it, you have to take on an identity. You're the person or the being that's going to get that thing and then enjoy it once you've gotten it. But that thing exists in a world. Part of that world may be totally irrelevant to your desire. You don't pay much attention to it. It's the parts that are relevant. They either help you attain that goal, that object, that pleasure, or they get in the way. And oftentimes you find yourself identifying with various skills that you might have developed in order to get what you want, to get past the obstacles. That becomes one of your identities. We have lots of these identities in the mind. And for most of us, that's how we find pleasure. That's how we find happiness in life. But the Buddha is pointing out that that way of finding happiness basically leads to suffering. It entails suffering. And if we follow the path of practice, we can put an end to all this. That means putting an end to the five clinging aggregates. It's for a lot of us that that's kind of scary, because we identify so much with them of the various ways of clinging. You can cling through sensuality, where you fantasize about sensual pleasures. You can cling through your ideas of about the world, your views about the world. You can cling through your ideas about what habits and practices are needed in order to negotiate that world, to find the pleasure you want. And you can cling by identifying with these aggregates. The Buddha says you can identify in one of four ways. Either you think that you are one of the aggregates, or a combination of them, or that they belong to you that you have a self that's some, something different from them but owns them, or that that self is inside them or they're inside that self. For instance, you may identify with consciousness and think that all the other aggregates are somehow there in consciousness, or you may have a little idea of a little tiny person inside you that's inside the body that looks out the eyes, listens through the ears. There's lots of ways that you can relate to these aggregates with an idea of self. All of them, the Buddha says, are suffering, stress. 
And so he has us analyze this sense of who we are, or what we own and what we control, into these five aggregates to see that there's not much there. So we can develop some dispassion for them, because that's what the duty is with regard to that first noble truth, is to comprehend them. And comprehension is defined as developing lack of passion, lack of aversion, lack of delusion for these things. Otherwise you're not passionate about identifying with them. At the same time, you don't hate them. The Buddha's not telling you to hate yourself. He certainly doesn't want you to be deluded about them. So you want to see clearly how you create a sense of self out of these things. This again relates to that idea of our being a being. Because one of the things that identifies a being is that beings need to feed. And this may be one of the reasons why the Buddha divides the pie up in terms of your experiences that you identify with, that you cling to, into these five. Because they're all related to how we feed. For instance, take feeding on food. There's the form of the body, and then there's the form of the food that we're looking for. There's the feeling of hunger that drives us to look for food, and the feeling of satisfaction that comes after we've eaten. Perceptions. You have to have perceptions about what kinds of things are edible and which kinds of things are not. This is how we learned about the world to begin with. We crawled around. We found something. What was the first thing we'd do with it? We'd stick it in our mouths to see if it was food. That's our basic category. Things are either edible or they're not edible. Then there's fabrication. This covers a lot of different mental activities. There's intention and attention. But the intention is the important part, because the mind is active. It's not just there watching things, watching the passing show without participating in it. It's out there looking for something to feed on. You want to find something that might potentially be good food, but is not yet there. It tries to figure out how to turn it into good food. And even before that, it tries to figure out how to find things to eat. All of that is part of fabrication. Then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. And then the Buddha says, we cling to these activities, because the aggregates are activities. There's one spot where the Buddha defines them as verbs, even form. He says it deforms. It's constantly changing. Feeling feels, perception perceives, fabrication fabricates, consciousness cognizes. These are the activities that we use in feeding, and we cling to them. We feed off of them, because the word for clinging also means to take sustenance. We feed off of these things. So there's a double layer of feeding going on. So we have to develop comprehension for these things. It means knowing them so thoroughly that we end our passion, aversion, and delusion for them. So how do we get to know them? Well, we turn them into a path. All the different factors of the path require different aggregates. Right view involves perceptions and fabrications, unconsciousness. Right resolve, again, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. Right speech, right action, that involves your body and your intentions, again, fabrications, perceptions. You can go down and make a list for all the different factors of the path. And they all require aggregates, use aggregates. But the relation is a little bit different. It's not, you don't cling to them in the same way. Instead of carrying them around on your back like a big load of rocks, you put the rocks down and you turn them into cobblestones so you can walk on them, particularly with the right concentration, like what we're doing right now. You're focused on the breath. That's part of form. You're trying to create a feeling of pleasure. To stay focused requires a perception, a mental image of the breath that you keep in mind. 
And then you talk to yourself about how well it's working, trying to get the mind to fit snugly with the breath. That's fabrication. And then you're aware of all these things. In fact, of the different factors of the path, this is the one that's the one where you're really going to be looking at the five aggregates very carefully, because you'll be feeding on them. The Buddha compares concentration to the food for the path. So as you fix your food and enjoy the food, you're really going to get to get hands-on experience with these aggregates, these activities of aggregates. And it'll involve some clinging, not sensual clinging. That doesn't play a role in the path. But with views, you have certain views about how karma acts in the world that motivates you. There are habits and practices. You have the habits of the five precepts, or the 227 precepts, the practices of concentration, and then self. There's the you who's doing this and is going to benefit from this, and who's also watching over things. That's a third function of this sense of self. It checks on the other two. Is the self as the producer really producing happiness? Is the self as the consumer satisfied? Is, is it, does it have standards that are good enough? Could its standards be higher? In fact, this observing or reflective self. That gets stronger and stronger as you practice, as you get more demanding about what kind of happiness you're going to take as satisfactory. Eventually it, too, will have to go, but it does play an important role. So you use clinging aggregates as part of the path, so as to get to know them is the state of becoming you create with concentration. It's a transparent kind of becoming. It allows you to see these processes in action, unlike other forms of becoming, say when you're involved in sensuality. The focus is out there on the object. And you tend to disguise from yourself the various ways in which you're lying to yourself about what's attractive about that object and why it's worth going for. Then you're lying to yourself about the bad effects that that particular desire might have. Whereas here, there's no need to lie. Think about the Buddha at the end of his austerities, trying to figure out you know, what was he going to do now. The austerities didn't work. What other path could there be? He thought about the time he'd spontaneously entered right concentration, the first jhana, when he was a child. The question came to him, why am I afraid of that? That pleasure, there's nothing blameworthy about it at all. This is one of the reasons why it's so transparent, because other kinds of pleasure make the mind murky, and they involve some, some form of harm. And so you have to lie to yourself about them, and that makes it difficult to watch yourself in action. Because it's not a pretty sight, seeing yourself looking for pleasure in ways that are actually harmful. So you tend to dress it up. Deal in abstractions. Whereas here you can watch yourself doing it, and you realize there's no harm. So you can watch yourself as much as you like. There's no need to hide anything. So this is the best way to get to know those aggregates. Make something good out of them, something harmless, something pleasurable. And try to develop this concentration to make it as solid and as subtle as possible until you realize that you've taken it as far as fabrication can go. Then the mind begins to be more and more inclined to want to find something that is unfabricated, 
It doesn't require a constant upkeep like this. That's how concentration alerts you to the fact that you need to use more discernment to figure out how you can find something that's not fabricated. So it delivers you to the threshold. The sermon does its work, and then it too, because it is made out of anger, it has to be let go as, as well. It's in this way that you learn to comprehend your clinging, craving. Abandon the craving. And you've used the Buddha's analysis of the five clinging aggregates for its purpose. So make sure that you see this teaching in context. Because if you take it out of context, it creates lots of problems. Like if you define what you are as the five aggregates, well, the five aggregates end with nibbana. Does it mean there's nobody there? Is it a total wipeout? When the Buddha was asked that kind of question, he kept saying, all he taught was suffering and the end of suffering. The point being that there are questions he didn't answer, that they're not worth answering. But the question about what do you do with these five clinging aggregates, he'd answer that. He'd try to comprehend them. Try to understand them to the point where you see them so thoroughly that any passion you might have for them just has no place to land anymore. And why would you do this? Because this is what leads you to the end of suffering. Always keep that third noble truth in mind, because it keeps reminding you that okay, by learning how to let go of these things, you find happiness that's a lot greater than the happiness that comes by holding on to them. It's a value judgment. But it's true. We tend to think of value judgments as being subjective. But this is objectively true. A happiness that's unfabricated has none of the dangers of a happiness that depends on fabrication. Because the happiness that depends on fabrication is always up for change, is always threatened. But the unfabricated happiness, that's not threatened by anything at all. Nothing can touch it because it's outside of space and time. But it is something we can find, something we can realize. As we take these aggregates and develop them into a path. And then learn how to have dispassion even for the path itself. <laughs>